Hi, so my name is Jade Stemmer, and today I'm going to discuss the toxicology and the study of bees. So first and foremost, I'd like to start off with a statistic I came across when researching, and this is that 28 to 37% of the honeybee population in the U.S. is lost every year. So this is significant because honeybees would domesticate for production of honey, and we also use them in crop pollination very often, even rent them out in some cases so that they can pollinate crops. So this is a really interesting fact I found just to spark your interest. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about what initially sparked my interest in honeybees. So for me, raising honeybees is what really got it going for me. So when I was 13 years old in middle school, we had a hive, we actually had two hives at our school. And this background image here is one of those hives. And so in middle school, we learned how to maintain the bees, how to process honey, how to process the wax for things like soap and lip balms. And then we got to sell them at our local farmer's market actually. So it was really fun, got me really interested in bees. And then in high school, we found out that we had a hive, a whole colony of honeybees living in the siding of our house. So here's a few pictures of the bees that I took in and around my yard. And so as you can imagine, having a whole colony of honeybees living in the walls of your house is not necessarily a good thing. Um, we decided to relocate the bees to preserve the integrity of our house because Honey is really heavy and wet, and a lot of the house is made of wood, so it's very damaging. Um, and now they actually live in a hive, much like this one right here. So this is really what got my interest going. It added to it, and I also knew that bees were having major die-off, and I wanted to research this because of how important it is to me. So as an overview, a few of the major points I'm going to discuss are toxins and their effects on bees, and then the environmental effects seen, as well as smart consumption and how in consuming honey and bee products, we can be smart about it. So first, toxins and their effects on the bees. So what are toxins? Toxicology is the study of harmful effects of chemicals on the environment. So this would be the study of all biotic environmental factors. So any kind of life within the environment is being studied with toxicology. Also, it's called the safety science because it is protecting this biotic life. So here I'm gonna discuss a little bit about the response by HB species. And we see in this graph three different species studied out of 120 different pesticides being used, these three species are studied the most often. So the first species we go over is Apis, which would be your typical honeybee. And these are important because as I said earlier, they're domesticated for honey production and crop pollination in a lot of cases. So another species we discuss, we will discuss is Bombus or the bumblebee. So these ones are a lot larger. Um, they are wild bees and they pollinate a lot of wildflowers and crops as well, but not as much. They're important because they're larger, which makes them more resistant to cold temperatures and higher elevation. So they're good bee to study as well. And then the third bee that was looked at in this study is Osmia or the mason bee. And these are solitary bees where all females are fertile, so they build their own nests and don't necessarily live in colonies. But they're also studied here. And then what exactly this chart is showing is how significant of a response these bees are having to insecticides. And this graph really shows the response with neonicotinoids, which is a specific pesticide. And I'll talk a little bit about what these responses are in the next slide. So neonicotinoids and their effects are seen in this graph here. And first we see one response of odor perception. 
And we also see spatial and color as other responses. So the perception fees, which are important because when they're foraging, they really need to rely on their odor to find flowers, color for value of flower, and spatial if they're flying. So, but we do see other responses as well, such as decreased motivation, their decreased um, desire to forage or initiation of foraging, their flight endurance is less, and their nectar collection is less, which will affect the hive overall um, of honeybees specifically because they're taking this back to their hive to produce honey so to feed all of the kind. And if this is decreasing, they're not gonna be able to feed as many. So here, we're gonna look at a little bit about what insecticides were studied. So neonicotinoids, as I discussed earlier, are the main focus here. Um, they would be this blue bar at the bottom, which have dramatically increased over time. Um, the x-axis represents each year that, of how much is being applied. And then the y-axis is a little bit more confusing. The AITL stands for acute insect toxicity loading, and the O represents orally, which means they're being dosed with it orally or fed the insecticide. And then low density of 50 here means that 50% of the test subjects die off so over a period of days, so typically one to four. And then the units of what they're measuring isn't really the same volume for each insecticide. Instead, it's actually a unit of how deadly, or a unit of the same 50% being deadly, or deadly to 50%. Um, so it'll kill the same amount of bees even if it's not the same exact volume of insecticide. And then, as we saw, the blue bar of neonicotinoids has increased so much over the past, even just decade, from 2000, 2010, and so on. It's still increasing today. And neonicotinoids, especially, have only been around since the 1980s. So they're relatively new, and they're not being regulated as often. So this increase, is just now starting to be monitored. So what are neonicotinoids and why are they the ones we really wanna look at other than they're being used so often now? So neonicotinoids can lead to paralysis when overstimulating an insect because they target the cognitive functions of the insects which is what they're supposed to do since they are supposed to deter insects from consuming crops. However, bees are also insects and they're being affected the same ways. So the main effects we're seeing here are they lead to these deficits, such as foraging ability, color perception, and so on. And they even lead to the paralysis of these bees or death in some cases. And these new nicotinoids are drastically increasing over the years, which is important because of how deadly they are and that they weren't necessarily studied and they're not being regulated as often. And then another important thing to note is that they are mostly harming the honeybees. As we saw from that first pie chart, the honeybees are seeing the most deficits from these applications. So one study I looked at was on almond orchards in California. So this background image here is of an almond orchard, and these are some of the hives that they had rented to pollinate their orchards when they're in bloom. So they only rent them during blooming season because they don't necessarily need them all the time. And what this study looks at is the year 2017 Californian almond orchards. So what they were looking at was that 1.5 million colonies were rented for these Californian almond orchards that year, in just 2017. And it cost over $250 million just for these almond orchards there. What they saw from this year was that 40% had had malformed brood or offspring, 
in their colonies, and it even resulted in a lot of death. And specifically, 20% of the hives had died off completely. So this is a major deficit for them, for the uh, farmers. Because $250 million you're spending on this, and then they won't be able to pollinate the crops that need pollinated, or else you won't have the almonds that you need to produce. So well, they really wanted to know why these bees were dying off and what they could do to stop that so they wouldn't have to spend so much money renting more bees. So in this study, they knew that they applied a lot of their chemicals at the same time and during bloom. So they were applying their fungicides and their insecticides together in these. And what this is, is a tank mix. So a tank mix is a chemical mixture applied to a crop. So this can be anything being applied at the same time. And in this case, it's just the fungicides and insecticides. Other scenarios involve um, miticides and other chemicals. Miticides would be for mites. This one's just for fungus and insects. But they wanted to look at what the synergistic effects were. So synergistic toxicity would be increased toxicity of this chemical combination. So where one chemical increases the toxicity of another chemical rather than either of them individually. They're more toxic together. So in this study, here is a image of a tank mix. And what a tank, so here they're mixing the chemicals as you see in here, and they're diluting it with water. So the concentration is regulated. However, it's only really regulated for our livestock and for humans so that we aren't being harmed by this. So there's really no regulations for how it's affecting pollinators. Since it's supposed to affect insects, they're not watching the regulations for this. But results from this study demonstrated that though fungicides generally displayed low acute toxicity by themselves to honeybees, when they were applied with the insecticides, they actually increased the overall toxicity. So we saw these synergistic effects here. And here's a figure from this study. The blue line here shows chlorantramilicol, which is an insecticide. And then the red line shows chlorantramilicol insecticide with propiconazole, which is a fungicide that they applied to these almond crops. And what they saw is in this x-axis, they show you the concentration of the insecticide. And then in the y-axis, they show you the honeybee mortality percentage, so like the rate of death when mixed and when alone. So as you see here, this red line is way steeper and goes all the way up to 100% mortality when mixed. So as the concentration of the insecticide increased, the death the mortality rate increased as well. And they actually, a statistic from this was that 7.2 fold increase resulted when combined. So the synergistic effects were dramatic in this study. And as you can imagine, now they're likely not applying them at the same time or when the bees are out to protect them and their financial deficits. So now I'm going to discuss a little bit about the environmental effects here from toxin and insecticide application. So first, the application of toxins. Here's an image of a tractor applying this tank mix. I'm not exactly sure what's in this one, but as we imagine, it's some insecticide, probably other fungicides and things added as well. And this image, we see how it's really a bulk application happening to the crop. And they're really, they're applying it to the crop. However, it's affecting all surrounding land as well. So it's blowing away in the wind. It's being applied to many plants, not just the ones we're trying to apply it to. So it's not only affecting this part of the environment, really. In this crop, we're, or in this graph, we're looking at what crops have the highest acreage in the U.S. over the years. So here we see overall cropland would be each bar each year. And the 
small highlighted piece would be what crop has the highest acreage each year. So corn would go from 2000 to 2010 as the highest acreage crop and alfalfa in 2011. So what we're looking at here is that approximately 350 million acres were cropland in 2011 in the US. I'm going to give you a little bit about the size or the scale of this. It's a little bit bigger than the size of two entire Texas states. So Texas is really big, but if we had two entire states of Texas that were just cropland, this is what the cropland would look like in America in 2011. And it has increased since then, even though it's not represented in this figure. So the next figure, we'll look at the amount of toxins applied to these crops. So I'll toggle back and forth a little, but I want to tell you again what the y-axis represents, which would be acute insect toxicity loading with the oral dose, which will be what kills 50% of the test subjects in a matter of days. So again, not the same volume, the same percent of dead bees per that volume or per each unit. And then what we want to look at here is what crops are having increased insecticide application. So here, we'll go back for a second. We see soybeans and corn are really large crops in the US, as well as alfalfa. So then going back to this slide, corn is the leading insecticide uh, usage for crop land in the US. It has the highest bar in 2014. And these are still going up because these insecticides are not being regulated. However, we also want to look at these other crops. Soybeans also increasing dramatically. Alfalfa really isn't noted here. It's a little bar that we can't see. But just the soy and corn alone, here we see occupy almost 300 million acres of cropland in the US. So 300 million acres that are having deadly doses of these insecticides applied. So this is really significant. We're applying these consistently. So in this slide, we're going to talk a little bit about pesticide use at home. Since we aren't these farmers who can reduce how much insecticide we're using, Though we can educate them and increase regulations, this doesn't really affect how we're using them at home. So as you can imagine, we do use insecticides on our own gardens if we're growing vegetables or things. But we don't want insects to eat, but we're, there are no regulations on how much we can apply. And since we don't have livestock, these things really doesn't necessarily matter to us um, as long as we're not being harmed by it, right? So these are being applied on all sorts of home urban gardens and in other urban areas like parks as well. And what they found were that these urban beehives actually had significantly more pesticides in them, in the waxes and honey that were sampled than those of agricultural hives. So I'll explain a little bit about the retention of pesticides in the next slide, but personally, we can just reduce our use of them and acknowledge that they're damaging bees, could harm us as well, and just be aware of this. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the smart consumption of bee products. So this is where retention comes into play. So pesticide retention, these pesticides can be retained in beeswax and honey alike, as well as all other bee products, right? And so from experience, I know that these are frames that we take out of hive, these hives. And you really drain them of the honey and collect some of the wax. And then you restore these frames back into their hive. So the bees can build back on them because they have these pheromones that bees really will be drawn to 
and they'll it's less work for them if they don't have to rebuild the entire hive. So they'll just build onto this. However, the waxes have been found to hold on to chemicals more readily than any other aspect of bee products or any other type of bee product. So by replacing these frames, we are building consistently the amount of toxins within them. So here we'll go on to types of honey. So as a consumer, we know that these toxins are building in the hives and whatnot. Uh, however, there is a smart way to buy honey. It doesn't necessarily involve knowing about how the retention of these chemicals are in the hive, but we can buy honey with some knowledge. So some factors that go into buying honey would be whether it's a blend or not, if it says pure honey. So if it does say blend, they can add things to honey such as artificial sweeteners and other, any other chemical really that they want to the honey. And the only regulation is that they have to call it a blend, which really isn't much at all. So if it does say pure honey, you know they're not mixing in other sugars with it or anything else. It's directly from the hive and filtered. Another thing to look at though is you typically want to buy a local honey, like this label here. This honey is a generic one from a grocery store. It says 100% honey, which may be believable. It does not say pure honey though. Um, but it does tell you where it comes from. So this one says it's a product of the United States, Canada, and Argentina. So this honey is being shipped in from many other countries, countries which we don't necessarily know their regulations on these insecticides either. And we don't know what they're adding to it. So it's a mixture of a lot of things. It could have many different chemicals in it. Whereas the local one, at least we know it's from the area we're living in and doesn't have other added stuff to it because it's likely pure honey. So another statistic I'd like to give you is that a study on honey found that 72% of the honey samples tested in the US have pesticide levels higher than the US EPA's daily intake would allow. So this is a really high number. 72% have insecticides that are really high in them. So why aren't we doing anything about this? Well, these honeys that we're buying at the store technically aren't considered food. So it's, they're not regulating them for how much insecticides can be present in them because technically they're not a food that we're eating, even though we are actually eating them. So we're dosing ourselves with these insecticides as well. So with this statistic, it's really important to be aware that there are high levels of insecticides in some of these. And so being a smart consumer is really important in buying locally and watching out for pure honey samples. So from this, we'll go move on to our conclusion. In insecticides, the, the main points would be that insecticides affect many cognitive functions in bees, such as color perception, um, motivation, and so on. The bees, uh, the important species of bees would be honeybees to study, while other bees are not expected as dramatically. Another would be there overall, there are increasing trends in pesticide use. So if we don't start increasing regulations, these trends will of increased usage will still increase. Another being the influence and increase in pesticide regulation and reduce our own usage of these pesticides. So just being aware and educating others will do a big part in this. And then also be a smart consumer. So read labels of things you're going to buy, especially if it's honey or wax products and you're going to use them, consume them, because we don't necessarily know how harmful they are to humans. And we're just now starting to study how harmful they are to insects. So if anyone has any questions, um, please get back to me and I'd be happy to answer them.
for my citation.